Well, welcome everybody to our sessions podcast. I can't tell you how privileged I am to uh, have our guest on. I, I would say 100%. I'm immensely privileged to spend our time with Dr. Hansa Bargava. She uh, listened on her website. I got a big smile on of this. She's a renowned speaker, an author, but she listened on her website. She's a mom first, a pediatrician, and a nutritionist. And somebody, as you guys know, I'm super concerned with holistic health and not just compartmentalizing when we look at health and development and functionality. But I love that she recognizes that she's like everybody else. I'm a mom, and I do have expertise in being a pediatrician. And of course, I'm fascinated to talk about nutrition and the gut-brain access and how that affects us. But uh, Dr. Bhargava has an exceptional purposely driven life that has taken her from being the senior medical director of WebMD to the chief medical officer of Medscape. She's often relied on as an expert for the White House and has an ex- is an extraordinary author who has facilitated parent coaching, uh, teachings in reduction of anxiety and stress, and uh, really talking about holistic health. So I am just I, I just can't say thank you enough to be able to spend some time with you and to hear your story and some convictions that you have and some maybe some techniques in helping us as psychotherapists and parents. So, Dr. Bhargava, welcome. Rob, thank you so much. And that was such a kind introduction, but I'm truly honored to actually have met you, to have met Sabrina, to know of your organization because you're doing tremendous work. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much. Well, I'd like to start off with just telling us, uh, yeah, what got you into this? Tell us a little bit about, of course, I, I love the story, but where did it begin for you? I would just love to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, if you really want to know about my beginning, I should start with I my do. own childhood, right? Yes, and, uh, yes. And so um, I, was, uh, I was born in Canada, uh, raised in Canada by um, an immigrant mom. Uh, you know, my my parents actually got divorced when I was about 10 or 11 years old, and my, I had two younger sisters. So my mom had a tremendous influence on me, um, both from the cultural aspect where, you know, she was trying to um, straddle straddle the line between like her old culture and the new Canadian culture. Um, and then also, of course, being a single parent and being courageous in that regard. Um, And, you know, um, holding down like a job, getting, you know, educated in different courses, which would make her more have even better job opportunities and raising three little girls all at the same time. (laughs) So, I mean, I can't tell you what an inspiration she has been to me in my life Um, and how even that time of wonderfulness, but adversity too. Um, you know, trying to kind of uh, be in that middle class environment. My my mom was an educated person. She had a master's degree in Sanskrit, uh, which was wow. is an ancient Indian language, but unfortunately not very relevant in uh, the 70s and 80s in Canada. Um, and so, you know, she had to re-educate herself, uh, taking college courses in various computer science and whatnot. Um, while kind of holding down a job in the daytime and raising these kids. And so there was adversity. I mean, I think it was hard. It was not easy. Um, But I think that, you know, my purpose and my um, main like line through all of what I teach is kind of rooted in that because I understood how important it is to ground the kids to um, also make sure that there's a family unit, that there's connections and communications. And that is like what I have taken with me wherever I have gone. So I'll stop right there. My my mind is running wild. Uh, Mom, just three girls, holy cow. Uh, That that is a lot to manage. So she in many ways has modeled this um, resiliency I, you know, if that's the term, I love that you le- use the term adversity. When, um, if I can ask, when does your identity and this sense of maybe well-being, or I'd love how you define it, when does that start to, to form for you? Yeah, and I think it was the kitchen tables <laughs> discussion. <laughs> like, uh, you know, we'd eat dinner, and she always she always insisted that we should eat dinner together. Um, you know, no matter how many things we were running to and from as as we grew up, and and so I think you know having that also like having um, a village, uh, we had a community 
um, where we would celebrate certain events, but also summers, long, lazy summers with my uncle at my uncle's place in New Jersey. Um, you know, and she was very close to her brother. So um, all of that kind of contributed. Those were all like ingredients in the recipe, right? Um, and then, of course, the the will to do good and be good, you know, to constantly like not just um, be ambitious and be driven um, to put education at the forefront, but also to constantly have that moral code, um, the ethical code to look at people like they are you, like, you know, they're just like you and always be good no matter what walk of life they're coming from and to try and help the greater good. So I think those are values she gave us. And, and from there, you know, I took that um, to medical school. Uh, I wanted to go to medical school because I was really interested in health and I wanted to help others. Um, and then I went into pediatrics because honestly, and I, I don't know if you agree with this, Rob, but teens and kids are so unique in terms of helping them, right? Because you have the possibility and the opportunity to influence such a long trajectory of life, right? Mm -hmm. A long trajectory of health whether it's physical, mental, or emotional, and to really do good in a person's life over a long period of time. So that's what, what attracted me to pediatrics and to kids and teens. Uh, was that something that you knew even in high school? Like, oh, I'm going to be pre-med and undergrad, and I'm going to go on? Was that... No, <laughs> oh. I didn't know that in high school. And that kind of goes back to, you know what, people, it's funny because I was talking to a mom yesterday at a at a parent event. And she said, well, how do you how do you make career pivots? You know, like, how do you actually change and what you know, she asked me specifically. It's so interesting, Rob, like to have this conversation right after on the heels yeah. of that conversation. But she asked me specifically, she's like, what what makes makes you brave enough to kind of just jump right and you've jumped several times in your career and and i said because i want to grow as a person right and so what also contributed was that in high school i thought i wanted to be an engineer right like i, I was a geek i was a nerd and i loved science and physics and i love science fiction and i still do by the way <laughs> um and and i love like movies that are science fictiony and and so um that's what I thought I would want to be, um, you know, and I wanted to be an astronaut or an engineer, an aeronautical engineer. But then, you know, I was I was really lucky to have um, someone who influenced my life. She was a doctor um, who was in our community and she's doing such great work in helping patients. And I was like, wow, like, that's really cool. So, you know, I changed around the age of 18 to 19 um, and decided to go down like the pre-med track. So, yeah. So now you're at 19, you recognize that boy, I want to integrate not only my analytical mind, but this humanitarian really values proposition to say, boy, how do I integrate those together? Wow, fascinating. And then when you go to pre-med, when does this thing of, oh, I'm going to be a pediatrician? When does that, how does that? Yeah, occur? so I think it was probably in my third or fourth year of medical school. We went through the different specialties. And again, like I was considering several of them. But again, like the, the I, I think it's two things, Rob. It's like, you know, um, what's the main theme? What's your main purpose at that time? It's to help people. OK, so I want to help people. But it's also just like that doctor who influenced me to kind of pivot to medicine. It's also people around you, the influencers in your life, I guess. Right. Um, sure. And so, you know, that, you know, again, I was influenced by my mentors, my teachers, you know, the people that I liked. And so, you know, we went on my pediatric rotation and, you know, I really loved these people. They were just so mission driven and just, you know, great people like Susan Tallett. She was my program director at the Hospital of Sick Children. And I had just so much respect and admiration for the way that she led her life. She was from South Africa, actually. Um, and and um, and just, you know, was just enamored by by the doctors who taught me. And so I think that's, you know, that, of course, influences you, right? Like uh, they talk about that in high school and school for kids and teens, you know, Find somebody who can be like their coach, you know, outside of their family, who they're enamored by. Is it a soccer coach? Is it their physics teacher? You know, is it their health teacher, their math teacher? And they have a huge influence, right? Uh, yeah, we always talk about mentorship is really one of those key things, is f finding those people. But it's interesting because we're hearing a lot more difficulty for parents finding that 
mentor for their kids or their kids aren't as active in sports or those people aren't as readily available anymore. It's really, I don't know if you're experiencing the same thing, but it's fascinating. I think it's very hard. Um, I think it needs to be, um, I think it's so hard in so many ways. And I could talk more about that and would love your thoughts, Rob, because you're such an expert yourself. But I think it's about the village. And, you know, if we look back at humanity, at different countries, at different cultures, there's a, a few threads that are the same, right? And I think the threads that are the same is connection and community, right? So as we go along, whether you go to church or temple or anything else, we had those people in our lives. Was it the priest? You know, was it the rabbi? Was it, you know, was it, you know, your uncle or the next door neighbor? And we were so connected, right? Like we were when, you know, I don't know, 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago. It seems like we've lost that opportunity. And I think that's what I wrote about in my book, like the overscheduling, um, the running and running and running and the race to nowhere almost has has had a side effect. It's had side effects of kind of derailing those essential threads we need as humans. My mind is really just, it's running wild um, because I keep thinking back to the, the pattern that you were even saying as a child, you had this village in Toronto. I, I had community, I had village. And just translating it into my psychotherapeutic language, that there was a place that village probably helped to be a focal point for stress management that I would just use the term co-regulation. There were secure attachment figures, a secure base that were all around you that when things were stressful, you could go back to that and maybe not even knowing it. And I know in today's society where we're slipping away from having that village mentality. And I wonder if maybe if you can speak to a little bit about as being a stress management expert, like did that function as a stress mitigator? And without the without that, what's happening? Completely. I agree with you. So you look at, you, people may look at my career and say, wow, you know, you've been successful, but what is that success coming from? And I, you know, I could easily, you know, people can say, oh, well, it's a success is because my education or, you know, my ambition or drive. But I really think the success, like success and happiness is rooted in that connection. Right. And that village. I truly believe that. And, you know, um, I think that for my own childhood and even now, you know, I went back to see my sister for a few days and, you know, I was, we have times in our lives where, you know, we're more connected or less connected. And over the last few weeks, I've been so, um, you know, so encompassed by work that I felt a little bit disconnected when I went to see my sister. I was like, oh, you know, I need some grounding. Actually, I need something. And it wasn't intentional that that happened at the same time. But when I actually hung out with my sister and my mom, you know, and her family, uh, after a few days, I was, okay, now I feel grounded again. I feel stable and now I can run again. And so just saying that to your point, like, I do think that we need to, as a society, make that a priority and set boundaries and say, no, I'm going to safeguard this because this is what feeds me. This is what feeds my emotional strength. It feeds my mental strength. It feeds my soul. And, you know, I think I think I wish that that's the message that people hear from my book, from my talks, that, you know, we must stop and we must prioritize and figure out, you know, what we really think is important. And that was important for thousands of years. And our brain has not changed in 50 years. It is the <laughs> same human brain. You know this, right? Like we all know this. Yeah, but we always think there's, you know, there's something new under the sun. This generation is unlike any other. I mean, I always smile, right? Because there, there's not. We have new technology, but yeah. And, and I wanted to point out that I wonder how many people, and I, I know your book does such a great job of talking about this. I would encourage everybody to get the book, of course. But is that I wonder how many people, just even adults in this day, aren't even aware that what this grounding could be or what it should be. We're just, we're so fast paced. Running. Maybe you can, we're, uh, <laughs> running, constantly, uh, sprinting. You're on the treadmill, yeah. 
So I would say two things. One is, look, I, I talk about the C's a lot, like the C's. So, you know, make room for the C's, you know, as a parent, as a teacher, as a person, right? Um, we all need room for the C's. And the C's are essentially co like compassion. So self-compassion. So people are like, what's self-compassion? What is that? Like bubble baths? I don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, but no, um, but it's not actually self-compassion by definition is an unwavering attitude of kindness to yourself. So when we, when something goes wrong in our lives and it always does, everyone has stuff that happens. What do we say to ourselves? Do we say it's all my fault? It's because of this, I should have done this better. I should have been stronger, faster, whatever. And, and, and what we, and because of so, like a lot of media, we feel like we should be perfect, right? Like social media is giving us these filtered versions, right? Nobody looks, nobody posts when, you know, bad crap happens. <laughs> like the, like the car accident where my bumper fell off. Like I'm not posting that. Like, why would I post that? Right. Yeah. yeah, but unfortunately, <laughs> would... it feeds the myth that we all have perfect lives and yeah. it's anything but the truth. Right. And so, you know, I think I think going back to all of that, like we have to a be aware that our lives will never be perfect. No one's is. And B, um, be compassionate to yourself. So I'm getting back to the C's. So the other C is really connection connection and connection to like an inner group of people. So like five people in your life. Maybe it's three people. Maybe it's one person. Whoever is your, you know, your person that you can go to when things go good and things go bad. And they'll give you positive energy back, right? But then there's also a wider community where everybody knows your name, like the cheers song, right? Like where, go to a place where everyone knows your name and it makes you feel like you're part of something. So that could be anything. Is it a book club? Is it, you know, your neighborhood, um, your neighborhood? Is it, you know, your church? Is it your temple? Like, what is it exactly? So those are the seeds that I think everyone should have in their lives. And this is, and the reason is because adversity absolutely will happen to each and every one of us. And I don't know if you agree with that, but I firmly believe that I've never met a person who has not had some sort of adversity. Let me just recap real, real quick. So I like the C's. We're talking about compassion, self-compassion, uh, connection, and community. Those are the ones that you've talked about. Uh, first, and yes, I do agree with the adversity is everywhere. I, I always like to uh, talk about when we talk about stress, and I know we'll talk about this going forward, but I, I always laugh because people have vilified stress and adversity to a point of I'm like, well, hold on a sec. Gravity exists and it's positive in our lives, and that's actually some stress on us. That's actually positive stress. You stress, right? Like stress exists. It just is it's the way we manage the stress. Let's stop vil vilifying stress because it's necessary and it exists. Hundred percent. I couldn't agree with you more. Right. And like I, I think the Trauma Research Institute has a great graph. Right. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's like it's almost like a heart rhythm. Right. Like you know our hearts go up and down, our heart rates go up and down. Right. But we have to be in this range of sixty to one hundred beats per minute. Right. So what we don't, we want our heart rates to go up and down. In fact, heart rate variability means that we're more athletic. So <laughs> the more we're able to do that, the better. Same for resilience. Right. Same for resilience. So we want to know, we want to be able to take that stress and go up and then come back. And that's, you know, that's actually healthy emotionally and mentally to be able to take those stressors and bring them back. What's wrong is if the stress is, if you are constantly living up here where you're in super stress state constantly, that's like sympathetic overdrive, like fight or flight response constantly, right? So that's not good. Or if you're like down here where you're cranky, irritable, and depressed, paralyzed, whatever. So you're right. I mean, some stress is good stress. We want our system to be stressed sometimes. Yeah. I wanted to um, a answer your question. So one is managing stress. Please, everybody, get the book, <laughs> read it. Uh, secondly, is you, you mentioned the term self-compassion. And as a therapist, I've been doing treating a lot of families, families, adolescents, children with what, what we call core shame. And I've noticed that when we talk about compassion, th that sense of like, yes, self-compassion is right, but it's fascinating to me how much that's a struggle when there's core shame, developmental trauma, whatever's caused that. 
that it really is a block. Like I'm not worth it. I, 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 I'm just, I'm not, don't know what this self-compassion is. It's my fault. I'm just unworthy. Blah, blah, blah. I, I know you've run into people like that. Um, what is your recommendation to when, when you run into that shame? I, I think you're absolutely right, Rob. And, you know, I was very fortunate to have stumbled upon this program a few years back when I was actually having some adversity in my life. Um, it was called Cognitive Based Compassion Training, Cognitive Based Compassion Training. And it's a program out of Emory University. There's several universities that have it, um, you know, different iterations. Stanford has one, too. Um, and, you know, basically, it is kind of where I learned about self-compassion. And, and they do like when you go back to adverse events in childhood absolutely right there could that can be the root of a lot of like self-bullying or you know i'm not good enough and all of that so i would say that that absolutely exists however the good thing is that we do have neuroplasticity in our brains right so i think that there is definitely a way to come out of that and this course is a really good one i think it was very very helpful for a lot of people but there's other courses trauma research institute has it there's all kinds of ways to actually come out of that but one of the biggest things we have to do is in my opinion is to recognize that we are often in sympathetic overdrive and that we constantly live in this like sympathetic stress like the the fight or flight response state and when we do that, it is very, very hard. And please tell me how you think um, with your background to see clearly because your lens is blurred. So I'll give you a really good example. So I was stressed out and tired and fatigued. Um, you know, I'd had a long few weeks um, a few years ago and my boss sent me an email and in the email he said something and I looked at it. It was like, I don't know, five or six o'clock in the evening. And I'm like, Girl, he, I mean, why did he say this? Uh, like, doesn't he understand that this is whatever? And I was just like, oh, or maybe it's me. Maybe it's me. Oh, I should have done a better job. Like, oh, this, this self chatter, right? The next morning I woke up and I had had a really good night's sleep, right? Again, another issue in the American culture. We're not getting enough sleep. Um, and my lens was clear. And so I opened up my laptop and I, I looked at the email again. I'm like, he didn't say anything bad. <laughs> like, he was just <laughs> stating a fact and he gave me a solution and there's just, there's nothing there. So I was so thankful that I hadn't replied to that email, Rob, like the evening before, but it just goes to show you that um, like a lot of these things of like self um, unappreciation, um, self bullying and all of that um, is a consequence of the fact that we're constantly in that stressed out state. So remember we said stress is good, but you have to be able to come down from it too. And if we're constantly in sympathetic overdrive and we don't activate our other system, which is a parasympathetic system, then that really causes havoc on our mental, emotional health, but also on our body, hmm. physical health, which is why we, we bonded so much on the holistic health, right? Like we're just causing damage everywhere. Like, why are we doing this? Well, I'm I'm not always amazed, but I'm always uh, wanted to highlight that people in sympathetic. I always talk about you know literally their lid is flipped and they're in this sympathetic place. Many times they get that's a familiar place for them to be, and we're trying to do therapy. And I always like to ask uh, how how has your eating been lately? Well, I'm surviving on a pack of Oreos and a bag of Doritos, and my body's craving this instant sugar, these carbs, blah, blah, blah. And we wonder why therapy is really hard. I mean, especially, I mean, you've seen it adolescents who don't have proper nutrition. And it's the snowball effect, right? We're sympathetic, we're hyperactive, we're in go, go, go. We want these instant fuels. And it's just, it's interesting. And I'm sure you, I'd love for you to speak to it. This, I call it the snowball, the snowball effect, right? Totally. We don't even want to, we don't even know how to come down from that, right? First of all, you know, the first thing of any curing any kind of uh, difficult state is to understand that you're in it, right? right. Acceptance, right? Um, so moving from denial to acceptance or like unclear to clear, okay, see myself that I'm in here. The second thing is to activate like solutions or interventions, right? So in order to actually step away from it, we need to actually do some work to be able to recognize it. 
But then let's just talk about the solutions for a second, right? We talked about the C's. So the C's are really important. Use It's buffers, right? Buffers to pull mm -hmm. us out of that state. I do think deep breathing, um, that's been shown scientifically to have, you know, boxed breathing or deep breathing. Uh, meditation can certainly help. But Trauma Research Institute has some really interesting methods to bring yourself out of that super sympathetic state also, like touching wood or metal and just focusing uh -huh. on it, right? And the National Institute of Mel uh, Mental Health actually has um, the 54321 method, right? To bring you back to the present, to calm you down. So these are things that are really um, interesting and important. And I guess I would say to the to our audience, our professional audience, you know, um, the self-compassion also means that you kind of have to take care of yourself in order to be the best deliverer of care. And that's why I took the course, actually, because it was offered free to doctors and nurses, healthcare workers who have severe burnout right now. And then I liked it so much, I went back and I did like a one and a half year training program. So I became a certified instructor of it. And it really changed my life, Rob, um, to get us out of that sympathetic overdrive. So we talked about connections to get us out. We talked about the Trauma Resource Institute method, the community resiliency model to get us out, the deep breathing, the meditation, or what they teach, which is a nurturing moment. So the nurturing moment actually pulls, it's a visualization technique where it basically takes you back to a time where you felt safe and makes you kind of sit in that time to kind of bring you back into the state where you can actually listen, that you can actually listen and you can inhale what you're being taught or talked to about. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I, I think all of our professional people will certainly appreciate those resources. Um, I like that you talked about the breathing. I think many of us, even as professionals, underestimate. Now, I'll geek out with you a little bit, if that's okay, that our, you know, deep bre deep breathing is, I, I, I love to say that the, the diaphragm is a the way to actually be able to regulate our central nervous system. And that diaphragmatic breathing really controls our heart rate variability. And so the, the breathing is just is just phenomenal. A little plug for Andrew, Dr. Andrew Huberman. I know you and I, you and I had that uh, in common. He talks about the physiological sigh being an amazing way that two breaths in through the nose and one long exhale. Just there's these techniques to really help be able to move you. And those are connected. And I think you're speaking to this. Being able to get that sense of personal regulation will help with the connection and the community as well. So so they all go together. They all go together. And they were a part of our, into, they were an integral part of the way communities have been, right? Because when we rest and we pause, we have an opportunity to do those things. Yeah. Well, well let, let me jump back because all of this is taking place and you have such an amazing mind. Let, let, let me go back if I can, because I know there's some personal stuff intermixed with you get done with med school. There's a lot has happened, may, maybe in an efficient way. Walk us through finishing med school and then your career gets going, if you don't mind, would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I finished at the Hospital for Sick Children with my residency. And um, at that point, um, again, going back to the career pivots, uh, you know, I decided that I wanted to go to the United States. So I came from Canada, from Canada. And there's, uh, you know, some, I, you know, there's some specialized training in nutrition at UPenn that seemed like a valuable opportunity. So I go there, um, I do that training. And then I, you know, I, I ended up um, practicing um, pediatrics for a while, um, actually teaching uh, residents. And I love teaching love teaching. I think it's a, it's probably from my family. My grandfather was a professor and so was my dad. And so it comes kind of through that probably. But um, so I, I taught the residents for a while and then I moved to Atlanta, Georgia um, and, and started working in the emergency room, urgent care centers of the Children's Health Care of Atlanta, which is a really big hospital system here. Yeah. Um, and again, I think it goes back to the self-confidence, the self-efficacy, because they wanted, um, when I first interviewed for that position, they said, well, you can be one of the pediatricians here. And I said, no, I, I think I'm, I'm well equipped to actually be the medical director. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. I know, right? <laughs> and I still remember, and I, you know, I emailed her, um, the person who was interviewing me, um, and she's like, well, you know, um, you're kind of young for that. And I was like, no, but look at my resume. <laughs> I, I promise you, give me a chance, right? The persistence, persistence, right? 
persistence is important. Um, yeah, yeah, and then after course. she saw the resume, she interviewed me and she was like, yeah, we're, we're going to hire you as the medical director at this urgent care center. Um, uh, we saw 30,000 patient visits a year. It was very, very, it was, I, I'm, this is important because thank you for asking, but it is important to the story, I think, because after about seven years of that, I was totally burnt out. Oh, it was wow. it was really affecting me because we had long shifts and my kids started saying, um, you know, why aren't you home for bedtime, mom? Why aren't you home for Christmas? Why aren't you home for this and that? Because I was working nights and weekends and all of that. And I just sat down one day and even before my kids came, actually, I was pregnant. I had, actually, I had to um, I had infertility issues. So finally I got pregnant. I was carrying twins and I was working these long shifts. And I remember like um, I wrote an article for Thrive about this. Uh, I sat down and the nurse brought a stool over and she's like, put your feet up. I was pregnant. I was so big. Um, and she's like, what are you doing exactly? You know, like, is this good for your is this good for your kids? like your babies. And unfortunately it wasn't, they came premature. Um, oh you know, and a lot of doctors, unfortunately, a lot of female doctors, um, because of the long training that ends up happening. But, um, but anyways, you know, that, you know, I was burnt out and that's when I, again, started looking, um, and, you know, found this amazing position at WebMD. So, so I think it's like, Look, Rob, I think adversity happens, but often it's that whole old saying, right? Like every cloud is a silver lining. Like we can't be afraid to pivot. We can't be afraid to jump, right? Sometimes there's something else behind the door. And the one thing that when I jumped to WebMD, somebody said to me that I'll never forget. And they said, you know, you will not know until you go through that door what other doors exist beyond that. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Don't be fearful. Can I ask, what was um maybe a, your biggest lesson learned or something unexpected that you took away from your ER time managing that? I, you know, that's such a great question. And I think it was such a good experience. Like I look back at it, I don't look back at it negativity at all. It was very positive. And the way it was positive was that I got to really understand the health system and the, um, the challenges of the health system, especially for those who are, you know, don't have as much resources or access to care. So our population was 80% Medicaid. It was 80% African American. It was in a poor area of town. Um, and we had the sickest kids come in, like sickest kids. Sometimes we would have to helicopter them out. And, you know, they were so sick. And I just felt like, like it was really an interesting experience because it really gave me so much understanding of what's going on, right? And the resources that we lack as a system, um, the inequities that exist and how parents are all, everywhere are struggling. And now with the mental health work that I do, I see that it's on both sides. Like it's on both sides. You have the lower socioeconomic groups that suffer because they might not have the access to um, you know, financial resources or food on the table. One quarter of our kids are actually food insecure right now. And then you have the upper echelons who are also suffering for different reasons. It's just hard to be a parent all around. Yeah, and it's hard to be a teen all around. <laughs> all around, yeah. So you have this significant experience managing this ER, and then you make a, a jump to WebMD I, I, I'm sure not only me, but everybody's fascinated. Tell me what WebMD is like, because you've heard this probably a billion times. My wife gets a, a hangnail. She gets on WebMD and she's got a brain tumor, right? And then I'm like, stop, take it within context. So I'm just fascinated, like, please, yes. What was WebMD like? It's amazing. Oh, my God. I was at WebMD for about nine years, eight years. Um, it was fabulous. And I'll tell you this. Some of the smartest people I know worked worked at WebMD. Truly, wow. not just not just healthcare professionals, but journalists, um, tech tech people, like you know, design, marketing, whatever. Like it was a group of people. We launched a lot of great products, but the the reason I liked them so much is because we all had the same north star, and that was like help the patient, like mm -hmm. give them information to arm them to arm them for their own health, to be advocates of, for their own health. And it was wonderful. So I got a ton of experience. I can, like, so grateful for that experience um, to get more experience and get, you know, grow in different directions that I never would have if I hadn't jumped, actually. Honestly, Rob. Yeah, no, I believe that. So, you know, it's stepping stones. You've got this um, ER experience. Now you've got WebMD and the pieces are coming together. Is 
now you get towards the end of your WebMD experience. Like, are you, is the book in your mind? What, what is next? I, I'm, what, what's next at this end of the WebMD I would career? say it was probably 2016, 2017. I was involved with a lot of public health initiatives with WebMD. We did a lot of partnerships with the CDC, the White House, this, that, and the other thing, right? Um, and I started seeing the mental health crisis starting. And that's what, you know, people are like, oh, the pandemic, you know, had such, yes, the pandemic did catalyze it, but it was absolutely there before. Seeing, like, just hearing stories personally of people who worked with me in the hospital or whatever else and the struggling as parents, you know, their, their kids cutting or, you know, becoming suicidal, becoming addicted to substances, like just this all. And I was like, what is going on? And then I started seeing the stress of my own kids. You know, I was a little bit tigerish. I'll be honest. My mom was a tiger mom. So like I learned from her. Um, and so I was tigerish. And then I started seeing it like my own kids having anxiety and stress. And I was like, oh my God, like, this story, these stories need to be told. We need to come together as a society. So that's where the book kind of started. Um, and then, you know, COVID happened. And um, during that period of time, unfortunately, I went through a divorce. And um, and so while I was going through the divorce, I was struggling. Of course, I was leaning on my people, my, my inner circles and the community, right? Because you got to, I mean, when you go through adverse times, you have to have people like literally with a safety net literally. catching you as you fall. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and and so that happened. And then that other thing that was really important that happened for me to kind of explore my mental health a lot more was my nephew died. So my nephew, my sister's uh, stepson, who is such a wonderful kid, just a wonderful kid. He's a hockey player, just compassionate, warm, wonderful. Unfortunately, um, has substance use disorder. Um, and bipolar disorder. And, you know, my sister struggled for years to help him through rehabilitation and all of that. And, um, and you know, in 2018, um, he lost his life to, to, to this and to the monster, as they call it. Um, yeah. You know, um, and, and so that I just, that really kind of catalyzed my journey. Um, I talk about it in my book. His name was Alec. Um, and and so um, all of those things kind of came together. And so I kind of followed that road. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's obviously such a need, Rob, like the work you guys are you and your organization is doing is just so important right now, more important than ever. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I can't imagine. Well, one is I'm sure your sister was leaning on you for all kinds of input. <laughs> I would imagine like, what do we do? You're the expert. What do we do? And even with all of that high level expertise, it, it, it didn't prevent a tragedy from happening. That was the saddest part. And I think to this day, like she feels like she somehow didn't do enough. Again, the self-bullying, right? And I'm telling her there's nothing else you could have done, right? It's hard. Man, parents of substance use disorder kids, I mean, they go through so much, so much. Yeah. It's so hard. And I think as as a as therapists, we, we might even underestimate how grief whether we're aware of the grief or it's hidden grief, actually might really impact our ability to have that stress tolerance, to stay and maintain that window of tolerance. I can't imagine your sister just so grieved that, oof, you know, you, you exist in that sympathetic place. And Yeah, you know, and this was really um, her husband's firstborn son. I mean, it's just oh, really, um, really hard. To his credit, he did actually go to experience Vipassana meditation for 10 days, oh, wow. which is a really hard one to do. Like they take yeah. everything away and you're basically yeah. in silence for 10 days. I don't think I could do it. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. <laughs> but he did it. I mean, Dan, good for you. And it really, really helped him um, with the grief. Um, but, you know, losing a child is losing a child. So... So, so walk me through the timeline. So then you, when do you complete your book? Building so Happier Kids yeah, gets building published. Building Happier Kids. So it started with the story that I was hearing and my own story with my own daughter. Um, I finished, I worked with the American Academy of Pediatrics. Again, grateful to them for doing this with me. They published it um, and they guided me through it. You know, they were obviously, they have the on the pulse of what is important for kids and teens. Um, so they, you know, kind of helped advise me um, on it. And it fin we completed it at the end of 2021, no, middle of 2021, got published um, in March of this year. 
Um, and uh, I had a book signing at the American Academy of Pediatrics National Conference like just a few weeks ago. So it was kind of fun, actually. Well, you're making such a difference. And uh, again, the, the book is fantastic. I think it's important to take it all in. Maybe just speak a little bit about, you know, I'm always concerned with not compartmentalizing health. I think that's an important, I think you are too. Like, let, let's look at this holistically. M- maybe what is one thing that as therapists, as professionals, that we can do to improve our practice by looking at clients more holistically. Yeah, and I think you're so right about that, right? Like, as as doctors, we often just tr- deal with the issue in front of us, but we actually have to look holistically at the mental wellness. Similarly, when we deal with mental illness, I think it's also important to understand all the factors that are weighing in on that person's life. So for example, like just basic things like do they have the C's, for example, right? Do they have the C's? Um, You know, or do the parents have the C's? Because those parents are like similar to that email thing. If the parents constantly have a blurred filter, how, how, what's happening in the home, right? Um, what are the socioeconomic resources that might be impacting them? You know, what, what other disparities could be I- impacting them? And then I think the other C is like the compassion, right? Like compassion, we never had a ch- we didn't have a chance to talk about this, but, you know, just trying to be compassionate to the patients, um, to understand them, to kind of get on their level, that they're just like you ultimately. That's why on my website, I say mom first, because I'm just <laughs> like you, like, I'm just like every other parent, like that's first. And to understand that everyone has their own crosses that they're bearing um, and to be kind, I think is, is really important. But lastly, sorry, since you asked me my advice to them is also self-care, like self-compassion and self-care means filling your own cup because you can't pour for others unless, you know, your cup is full. And that that um, starts with kindness to yourself, but also giving yourself space to to, to kind of um, replenish yourself is, is so important. Well, and I really appreciate this looking at it as the kindness piece, the community, the connection, seeing those things, because so often we think of self-care as I need a longer vacation. I need <laughs> something to uh, distract me from what's happening. And just knowing you have to come back to the same environment it's just it seems to perpetuate the cycle of actually that type of self-care is not fulfilling your well. I totally not... agree with you, right? Because, you know, I went to a talk by Dan Harris once, mm. right? He wrote that book, 10% Happier. Right. And um, he was an ABC anchor. I don't know if, you know, um, you remember that. But um, he had a panic attack on air, right? And that's what made him kind of stop and do things. And And so he said in his lecture, it was so interesting, he's like, how many vacations can you go on? How many five-star hotels? How many four-star hotels? How many three-star hotels are you going to stay at? How many beaches? The happiness is actually inside you. Like wherever you go, you take it with you. So if you're not feeling it here, it doesn't matter if you're in Bali. It doesn't, right? Like it kind of has to be here. Um, and that's how we get to that is actually being kind to ourselves, kind to others, and having those circles around us to catch us, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. No, I really appreciate your perspective. Yeah. Um, as a psychotherapist, I do want to ask you this question because it's always, uh, we love working with psychiatrists, love hearing from the pediatricians, and you're bridging this gap. What do you see as being really effective when it comes to psychotherapy? When you refer clients or like, what is it, what do you see as valuable when it comes to psychotherapy? Look, psychotherapy is so essential, so important. And I think, you know, I would say the most effective things as a, like being on the outside as a pediatrician is really like holding hands with the parents and the pediatricians and the providers. Like we are all in it together and we want to, you know, make that circle around the child or teen. So kind of communication being really, really important, not just with the kids, not just with the families, but even any other doctors or experts that are involved is is very, very important. So that's one thing. And secondly, like if there's any way, like, again, I know I'm plugging this self-compassion thing, but get make sure you're mentally and emotionally well yourself, because that will enable your gla- your lens to be clear and for you to be more compassionate, seeing it and and be able to have the side, understand the side of the family even better than you are. Like, obviously you guys are, right? Because that's what you do. But I'm just saying, even to clear it even more, um, that can help. There was a great article in The Atlantic. Um, I don't know if you saw it, but it was basically, um, 
uh, power, something to the effect of power injures the brain. Oh. Uh, it was excellent. You know why? Yeah. Because it talked about how like as people climb the ladder as professionals or as politicians, as CEOs, whatever, there's parts of the brain that actually shrink and there's parts of the brain that get grower. And you and I know neuroplasticity of the brain. So when the amygdala grows because we're not taking care of ourselves, we have burnout, like whatever it is, um, then you lose your ability to see broadly and to see other people's point of view. So the whole argument about that article was that it, there's, there is damage that happens if you can't see broadly. Ultimately, it affects your profession and your c capability of doing what you want to do. So um, I think that's really important to make sure that our lens is clear. So the self-compassion piece, we could really have some more clarity around what that looks like. Having the psychotherapist, I, we always like to use the term, we have to do with the parents as we want them to do with their children. The 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 adolescents, because oftentimes they're, you know, we as therapists can even be boiled in expectation like the parents are like, well, just make them better or, or do this and or their parents, they should know better, right? Like, oh, I, I, I tend to cringe because then we lose our compassion for the parents and their narrative and their story, their attachment history and their ability to maybe they have unrealistic or inaccurate expectations or unresolved grief or whatever that is. So working I'm hearing you say, help help the parents get into that place of self-compassion. But it is, I would use the term experiential, that we as psychotherapists can help facilitate that self-compassion. Because oftentimes, as parents, we're, we're, we're boiled in it. We can't see the forest through the trees, no, right? No, we can't. <laughs> it's so hard. And like the patients I've dealt with, which are like, and you know, pediatricians and physicians often have what we might call challenging patients, you know, not really listening. They have their own seeming, their seeming agenda or whatever. To penetrate that is just to literally get to their level, right? And say, hey, I'm just like you. I'm a parent. I like, and, and that was the most effective for me. Like when I actually was able to really communicate with them eye to eye, you know, and say, I want to do for your child or teen what I would want for my own child and teen. You know, and and that's when they really listened, actually. That's when they listened, right? So I think for us to be able to put ourselves into the parents' shoes enables us to communicate more effectively to them. Don't you think? Empathy, empathy, empathy. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. like a circle. So if I can, just catch me up to catch me up to today. I mean, how are things with your kids? How, how are things with your life? I'm just, you know, because we say it's integrated, right? Your story is part of your expertise. Yeah. And Rob, like, you want the truth? How is it? <laughs> I do want the truth because I believe that adversity and growth is part of, of our story. And adversity growth totally is. And so, um, look, it's, it's, you know, it's not easy being a parent. It is not. You know, I have two kids that are absolutely different. I have to honor their differences, right? Honor their differences, tweak my communication style according to their differences, right? It's, it's, it's a constant tweaking of communication style. And you have teens as well. Like when they were 11, how do we talk to them? When they were 13, how do we talk to them? When they're 16, how do we talk to them, right? And it's constantly like resetting everything, right? Um, and then resetting according to, to the kid. But I do think that as a parent myself, what I've learned is my North Star is keeping those communication lines open. Because if I lose that communication and trust with them, they're not going to come to me if there's a crisis. They're not going to come to me if things go bad. They're not going to come to me if things go good, but they might not, but they won't come to me when there's a crisis. And that's why communication is like one of the C's. The C, we're going back to the three C's. It's actually five C's. The fourth C is actually communication. That's the big C. Yeah. And then the fifth C is calm. Calm. Finding can, calm. Can I ask really quickly, what are the a couple of factors that are the biggest blockers to that communication with the kids? Be it your own kids or parents, I would think there's a few things that come up that are like, ooh, this will hinder your communication. Check your ego at the door. Ah. I think that's true of everything, right? It really is. It Good really is. Because, you know, authoritarianism, I don't think really works. Um, you know, um, I think that uh, I really try hard to bring them back to the family values. 
Um, and sometimes it's the chat that, hey, you know, I don't really care what other people are doing. This is what's happening in our home. And these are the reasons why. Like, you you got to give them reasons why, right? Um, and, you know, I think sometimes you just have to check yourself at the door. <laughs> like, don't walk in bringing your job with you, <laughs> right? Okay, this is my, I'm putting my parent hat on and taking the moment to have, find that calm. The calm is so important as a parent. I think it's so important, like, because then that'll stop you, like, um, taking a breath before you react. Mm. Really important, right? Victor Frankl, I think we talked about this, right? Yeah, Victor we Frankl. did. Yeah, man, search you for know, meaning. Yes. Yeah, right? And it's really like an event happens and then there's a reaction. But the space between the event and the reaction, if you can just, like, be able to control that, like, whether it's a deep breath or just looking the other way for a second while you compose yourself or just saying, hey, you know what, I need a few minutes. I will talk to you in a few minutes. I will talk to you tomorrow morning about this because I'm not at my best moment right now. <laughs> Whatever it is, we got to do it, right? And and again, I, I know I keep going back to self-care, but that's why self-care is important because it kind of keeps your lens clean. Well, and all those things actually reduce defensiveness. I mean, we all know that adolescents, but most people who pretty easily triggered into defensiveness and as well as us. And then we lose the safety and the compassion and the ability yeah. to be open and all oh, that connection true. is lost. And there's techniques. You're, I love what you're giving us. These are techniques to reduce your own, calm yourself, reduce your own defensiveness and not trigger the defensiveness in others. Really tremendous. So, okay, so I've got some really questions. The big ones I love to ask. Uh -oh. what, what part of your story is untold, is still untold? Yeah, I knew that was going to come my way. Rob. You knew it was coming. I, well, I, I got to ask it. I got to ask it. It's the big one for me. Yeah, I mean, I think the story, the part of me is really that's untold is I do want to make a difference. I want to help people. You know, I, I, I want to continue on that journey. The question is, where in the health sphere can I really make most impact? And by health, I mean holistic health, not mental health, not physical health, but the two are very tied together. So how can I really um, do that? Because that is like what I really would like to do. Um, and that's really the start part that's untold. I, I think I'm making a difference. I want to make a bigger difference. And, you know, what is that? How, what does that look like? Is it is it um, like the 360 degrees of health? Like, is it um, looking at different ways to deliver therapy for mental well-being? Is it prevention? Is it public health? You know, what is it exactly? Um, and then the other story that's untold, of course, that's a huge part of me is, you know, the parenting story. I mean, mm -hmm. we all want to be successful parents, but what is successful parenting? It's, to me, it's not about getting into, oh, the first year of college or the big fat job. It's really about helping my kids find happiness and contentment. I love it. Love it. What, what, what legacy will you leave? I think there's a couple of things that I feel like we're missing as a society, and that is honestly hoping to bring people back to fundamentals. Um, fundamentals being just, you know, you know, just the importance of health, the importance of community. Um, I'm hoping I can make a difference there. And also, Rob, the importance of preventative health. Talking a lot about chronic diseases and, you know, um, uh, issues around mental health and all of that. But I really believe that we should start upstream too. We should really have that conversation. So I would say to psychotherapists that might be listening is, is there something you can do to kind of teach resilience? And resilience is an overused word. Maybe the <laughs> yes. word is emotional, mental um, fortitude. Mm. Um, to to understand, to let, let people understand um, that, or let teens understand that, you know, Sadness and happiness is part of everyone's life. Um, that sometimes it converts into a disease or an illness, but often, often it's like that resiliency model, right? So, um, talking more about prevention and how we can do that, and I do think the three C's are part of that. I do think, as you and I talked about, what you know, um, the Huberman Labs talk about, like sunlight's part of that, nature is part of that, exercise mm -hmm. part of that, sleep is part of that, right? Like there's physical attributes that are part of that too. Um, so there's a lot of pieces to that pie, but I really do think we need to come up with upstream solutions also. I said it was probably my last question, but I lied. That's not my last question. 
So being a medical doctor, you know, medication is just on the rise like no others these days. Maybe just take a moment. What's your view on medication with this whole relationship with stress management and adversity and functionality? And I view it as one piece of the pie. Hmm. There's a 360-degree pie. Some of it's prevention, obviously psychotherapy. Maybe it's even psilocybin, right? Maybe it's, you know, um, other alternative forms, meditation. There's so much there, right? And I think medication is in its place, but it's not all of it. Like we can't just go to the Rx. We can't. Uh, we just can't. And I think one of the things that is really something, a challenge that we all need to work on is we need to have like a three or four prong solution. It can't be a one prong solution. Most people need multiple prongs. <laughs> Well, it seems like our society is looking for the hack on everything. Yeah, like the magic pill, literally, right? And there isn't a magic pill, guys. Sorry. Like... Well, I always laugh because I have to say to parents in a very compassionate way, there's no pill for shame. They haven't developed that one. We have to work through it. We've got to do it. We've got to look at it holistically. And how do we... You know, it's you so know... true, Rob. Like, how do we kind of shift the culture? Yeah. How do we shift the culture to actually understand that? There is no magic pill. You got to work through it. Adversity happens. You got to let it go. Like, you know, let's be a team. Let's be a community. Like the we, not the me. Like there's so many things. <laughs> I think this is a, a perfect way. And I thank you for so much joining me and telling your story and your own vulnerability. I mean, you're a living model of what it really takes to look at connection. I mean, all of those who have who have had the privilege of listening or drawn into the story and relating it to our own lives. We all face adversity. The and struggle if, is real. Yeah, the struggle is real, but it's an inevitable, inevitable part of our existence and not be over, overwhelmed by it. The flip side is every time there's a struggle, you grow from it, right? Yeah. Like yeah. you build that muscle, right? You go to the gym and it hurts the day after, but guess what? You're building those muscles. It sounds cliche, but I always push Carol Dweck, Growth Mindset, pick up the totally. book. It's a really great, simple read. Yeah, really fantastic. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for joining us and being a part of this. You've joined our community. We're a part of yours. I think this is a great step in making the movement. Um, yeah, thank you so so much for your time, Dr. Bhargava. Rob, it's such an honor to be with you guys. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's been such a great conversation. I really hope to work together with you more on all these wonderful things. Yes, we will. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. This has been Sessions. Please look for us and listen to wherever you can access podcasts.